Om te dien yoga nugata pasyan, devat mashaktim svagunayar nagudam, yaha karanani nikilani tani, kalatma yuktanya adidishtat yekaha. Om shanti shanti shanti. Practicing the yoga of meditation, the ancient seers of India beheld the divine being existing everywhere and in everything, which though veiled by its own modes of nature, by name and form, was nonetheless one and indivisible, and which had been incomprehensible earlier due to the limitations of their own intellects. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Vedanta Siddhanta Nirukti Resha, Brahmaiva Jiva Hamsa Kalam Jagadcha, Akanda Rupa Stiti Reva Moksho, Brahma Vitiye Shrutayaha Pramanam. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. It is the apt and final conclusion of the Vedanta that all is Brahman. Time, space, living beings, and the world. Living in constant recognition of this fact is what is called enlightenment. Brahman is pure and perfect, one without a second. And the revealed scriptures are the sure and certain proof of this fact. Om peace, peace, peace. Om Sahana, Om Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Bunaktu, Sahaviryam Karva Vahai, Tejasvi Navadita Mastu, Mavidvishu Vahai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. May Brahman protect us. May Brahman sustain us. May Brahman illumine our thinking process. May we not find fault with each other, with the world, and with the teachings. And may what we study be a source of inspiration to us eternally. Om peace, peace, peace. May peace be unto us. May peace be unto all. Om Hari Om. And now we have all gathered for the second in a series of classes called Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. <clears throat> and last week we went through the teachings on the Bardo states. That is, the focus was on how to be reborn consciously, which is going to uh, presume that you also go to your death, your so-called death, passing from this particular form, this particular body called the not-self, in a state of consciousness and also that you've lived a life based on spiritual practice. So those two are requisites for a conscious rebirth, that is a rebirth in higher intelligence, higher wisdom, in knowledge of that matra or that intelligent cell that we're talking about, that particle of intelligence that we've had series of classes on. That this is a stream like any other particle streams, only this stream is, is more like the sound emanating from a bell or light emanating from a sun. There are metaphors we can use in everyday life in the world, uh, but this is something that can't be seen with the eyes. Although some report to see a sort of aura or a divine light emanating off of beings who are immersed in the stream of intelligence. Higher consciousness or timeless, deathless awareness. Sometimes we borrow those terms in English to explain Sanskrit words like Brahman or Atman or Chaitanya, Pragyaparam, uh, Tathagatagarbha, if you want to go toward the Buddhist 
way of speaking. And we will go toward the Buddhist way of speaking today because the subject of my talk is Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. We recently gave a retreat on Zen Buddhism about a month back while we were in Oregon at the SRV ashram there. <clears throat> Prior to that, I remember a student saying, um, I'd really like to come to your Zen Buddhist uh, retreat, but it's not my path. I'm a Vedantist. I said, if you were a Vedantist, you wouldn't say that. <laughs> because what have I been telling you all this time? That there is no such thing as a foreign religion. That all religion is... Indigenous to your soul. Indigenous to your soul. And so that goes very much hand in hand with that saying in the ancient scriptures, probably the most ancient scripture, even if you take into consideration carbon dating, as they call it, the Rig Veda, many thousand years prior to Christianity birth. Uh, and uh, that saying is, Ekam Sat Vipra Bahuda Vedanti. Ekam Sat is one truth. And so the idea is that there is many paths leading to one goal, or truth is one, seers call it by different names. Sometimes you get that interpretation from it. So that is something you need to understand about Vedanta, that it that actually turns things universal. It's the universal appeal of the Vedanta to make a Christian a better Christian, a Hindu a better Hindu, a Jew a better Jew, a Muslim a better Muslim. So it's not really a denomination we're talking about when we speak about the universal Vedanta. So in that regard, you should shine its light on every path, particularly the path you were born in, which is for us is Christianity. We were born here in, in basically in uh, Christian culture so and Jewish uh, culture too, so we have to look at Christianity and Judaism through this very special boon. And Ramakrishna Paramhamsa is our teacher and the ideal of this ashram here, along with Holy Mother and Swami Vivekananda, has put it in those no uncertain terms as well, that we have to uh, go beyond Quran and beyond Bible and beyond Vedas, but by knowing the Quran, the Bible and the Vedas first. You can't discard something or, or put it behind you or even put it away until you have known it. That's why I just chanted, the revealed scriptures are the sure and certain proof of this. Of what? That all is Brahman. Tattvamasi, that thou are that too. So with this very non-compromising and cutting edge Advaita Vedanta, we're calling these series of classes Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. We called the recent retreat Zen Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta because that clarifying agent is there in the Vedanta, its ability to do that. It's sung in many different songs, for instance, this one. <laughs> A new man has come. If you want to see him, come along with me. He wears over his shoulder a shoulder bag, and inside of it is only two things, Vivaka and Vairagya discrimination between the real and the unreal, and detachment from the unreal. That's the Ramakrishna Paramahamsa song written by Devendranath Mazumdar for the great master. It goes on in the vein that we were just talking about too. It says, <laughs> Aqua water, water, honey, Vari nama de jole. Aqua wawa, water, honey, Vari nama de bole. You might have aqua, water, water, pani, vari, these are all different names for water in different traditions, in different languages. And uh, all different names, nama, 
de Jole, and then Allah God Isha Musa. Mm-hmm. Allah is the uh, Almighty uh, in, in Muslim religion, and God is what we call it in tradition, in our tradition here, in, in Christianity, that is. Isha is the name for the chosen ideal in Hinduism. Musa is Muhammad. Uh, Kali, Nam, Bebole. Kali is the Divine Mother, the ideal of the Shaktas. So, many different names for water, just like that. There are many different names for God, but it's all one substance. See, In the case of water, it's this liquid. And in the case of, of human beings, it's consciousness, that one foundational. They sing it in other ways, too, in very beautiful ways that uh, this theme, you might call it, of... Um, Universality. Jo kucha hai so tu hai tu chse hamne dil ko lagaya kya mula. Kaaba, you fashion them all and you cause beings to move into them and worship. You have become the worshiper, the act of worship, the place of worship. Nothing exists but thee. This beautiful non-dual axioms and truths placed in a devotional setting. They're very effective. Uh, it goes on to say, God, goddess, man, woman, Hindu, Muslim, and Christian, all are brought into existence by thy own inscrutable will. What are these beings without you? They all exist in you. Further goes on to say, from the life heavens, throughout the boundless universes, and into the darkest nether worlds, wherever our souls journey, we find only you, but nothing exists but you. It's called a Ghazal, it's a beautiful spiritual classical folk song, if you will, of India, and with a very non-dual turn to it, and um, very beautiful, evincing these non-dual ideas, you see. So at the foundation of all these paths is this one reality, and Vedanta is focusing on and emphasizing that, and especially with the coming of Sri Ramakrishna, a new man has come, if you want to see him, come with me. Because he will show you um, that all religions have the same essence. They might be different in their approach and have different terminology. Many of the teachings are similar, as you'll find out today, and if you've found out in the past when you've attended SRV classes, they just have different terms. So, God, Allah, Isha, Musa, Kali, whatever name you want to call that reality, you should know that they're all one and the same. That is, they're one in essence. And they appear differently from time to time, from age to age. So with that message given, we can plunge into a teaching that signifies very much this non-duality. There it is, called the Mahamudra, or the Great Seal. This is a Tibetan Buddhist teaching and has very powerful implications to it. Um, it's actually quite simple, simply profound might be a better way of saying it, because it's put in such a way that it gives you an opportunity 
to really imbibe the non-dual essence of something without a lot of complications and without a lot of, of technical um, problems as far as wordage and so forth. It's been put in such a way in English from the Tibetan language that it's very comprehensible. First of all, in the upper quote here, it tells us that the Mahamudra was revealed by the Mahasiddha Tilopa, re revealed to him by the venerable Bodhisattva, Samantrabhadra, and was then transmitted to Narada, to uh, Marpa, and then to Milarepa in a sacred lineage succession. We call that Guru Parampara in Vedanta, from Guru to disciple, and the disciple passes it on to his disciples and students and so forth, and it comes down through a succession. And that is the Dharma and the teachings that show or reveal that essence of consciousness in everything, so that one doesn't forget it and one can live a conscious life and pass from the body consciously and be reborn consciously as many times as one would choose as a bodhisattva, like, say, examples of Kala Rinpoche and Dalai, and Dalai Lama and, and Karmapa and so forth in Tibetan Buddhism today. Many different lives they've come back as the same soul and they remember their past circumstances and they never forget their message or their vows. So in that way, it started off in Tibet there, some 700 A.D. or so, when Marpa went across the Himalayas, which was very difficult to do at that time, and um, came down into India and learned it from um, Naropa, who had learned it from Tilopa. And these were Indian yogis, as it were, and uh, with that Buddhist, in heavy Buddhist influence from uh, Lord Buddha, who had lived some thousand years previously, 550 years before Christ, and learned that great uh, Indian darshana, we call it, uh, called Buddhism, and brought it over the mountains back to, to uh, Tibet, and then had his first major disciple in Milarepa, who learned it from him. So uh, when we began to pick up on these special teachings like the bardo states we had last week and the Mahamudra that we're picking up today, the great seal it's called. Mudra means a kind of seal or uh, a kind of uh, position that you take. It can be a hand position, that's a kind of mudra, but it also could be a, a mental mudra, like a, there are physical asanas, but there are also mental, mental asanas, as we've learned in the past. Certain um, stances or perspectives that you take based upon higher intelligence, higher and your deeper vows and so forth, that you're not going to deviate from once you take them on. Uh, they can, they could be anything from uh, brahmacharya or celibacy to monasticism or sannyas or a vow to practice sadhana and study scriptures and meditate. All sorts of those things uh, build up the spiritual fiber of a person, it gives them character and allows them to begin to live a conscious life. So this has been done then in Tibet for some 1300 years now. It's had that much time to develop. And one of the beautiful things that's come out of the teachings uh, of Buddhism in Tibet is this Mahamudra, the Great Seal. It can be put, and it says here, for the practitioners of Dharma, this is a precious gem. So I'm taking that, uh, both words, practitioner and Dharma, in a universal way. For all practitioners of spiritual life, for, for the Dharma in, that is in all of those paths, uh, that is the seeking of the truth or the Dharma or the wisdom, um, that's a precious gem for everyone to, to listen to and take heed. So it basically is, is based in these three principles of the central practice of Mahamudra. One is the view, one is the practice, and one is action. So it's already very practical and very down to earth for us. It's not something that's too cerebral and it's not something that's too transcendental. It's very much right down to earth that we can see this Buddha nature in everything what Vedanta would call the Atman or the Paramatman. Uh, Buddhism would call Tathagatagarbha or Pragyaparam, the supreme intelligence Buddha referred to. So as far as the view, you can see written here, the view is what? How should we view everything? That all manifestation, the universe itself, 
is contained in the mind. That's the first part of the view, that everything comes from your mind. And we've been speaking of that in terms of the 24 cosmic principles of Samkhya and the eight limbs of yoga and the various teachings of the Vedanta. We have so many similar and correlative teachings about um, the mind-only schools, they're called, that everything is a manifestation of mind. Like, like I said, like a, a candle radiates heat and light and like a bell emanates sound, the, the great mind emanates intelligence. It's a, it's a great sun of intelligence, if you, if you will, or a great bell called the Om, or the Word. And it's unstruck. That is, until it's struck, universes don't appear. If it remains unstruck, then everything is held in potential in it. So, almost correlative again is the Mahat, the great mind of Samkhya, with this sound of Om that Christ was trying to get the, his apostles to understand. In the beginning was the Word. He was always trying to get them to look into that deeper nature of vibration. And by, then they will find these streaming particles, not just of physical atomic variety, but atmic. The atomic, atmic. <laughs> and everything that's in between, which is called chitta or thought vibration, and mind, how the mind vibrates, how the senses vibrate, how objects vibrate, and tracing them all back to a very definite source. So, my point here in bringing up the Mahamudra is that the view of most people, that is the view of the worldly people, the view of the ignorant people, the view of the intellectuals, and the view of many religionists is that, is that of creationism, which is a very loaded term, as we've been talking about lately, if you look it up in the dictionary or in some uh, various settings. But um, this idea that, uh, that everything has come out of creation uh, is rather contrary to what the mind-only schools are pro proposing. So if you start to study the Vedanta or Buddhism or other systems of Eastern India, of, of, of the East, that is, in India, you'll find that they're thinking in terms of mind-only schools. Put very nicely here, your view should be that all manifestation, the universe itself, came from the mind. Now that means the mind on three levels. The cosmic mind, which is God's mind, which is different than God, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. When it was with God, then it separated itself. The Word was something different than the reality. It separated itself so that separation could be given birth. That's where the ego starts in, the ego mind mechanism. So uh, before it separated itself, then it was just itself, homogeneous, pure, indivisible, all-pervasive, eternal. You look for words in English to try and explain the undescribable, the inexplicable, but there they are, and they can confer a certain understanding to you, almost a taste of that in yourself. You see, you have to look for it inside yourself. So you look for it in the great mind first. So you are going to connect to the cosmic mind through what? Through the collective. The collective consists of what? everything from the Trinity on down to gods and goddesses, on down to, to uh, asuras and uh, suras, and on trickling, trickling on further out into the ancestors and into the demigods and further out into the humans and finally coming all the way down to animals and insects and plants in one march, you see, in an emanation, in a flow of wisdom particles that get grosser and grosser and grosser until they're atomic particles. Reverse the process and they become finer and finer and finer until they become intelligent particles. And that is what people have been labeling creation, preservation, and destruction in cycles. What we're proposing then in the mind-only schools and people who are not, I'll use a Hawaiian word here, akamai, means in the know, they're not in the know about something other than the theory of creationism uh, are going to find this very uh, endearing, maybe. They're going to be very attracted to this ring of truth that has to do with all, everything is in the kingdoms of heaven are within me, because that's exactly how Christ put it. 
the kingdoms of heaven are within you means all these gradated levels of consciousness are within you and they emanate out like the peal of a bell once it's struck and then they return to the bell when the great tone disappears over uh, 400 and 320, 4 billion, 320 million year cycles times 4 times 8 times 16 until you get into these very, very long cycles of time called yugas and maha yugas in our tradition. So the first part of this Mahamudra teaching and the view is that you must understand that there are many, many illumined souls, many, many illumined souls in different traditions that are thinking in terms not of getting something out of nothing or not of creating your soul out of dust. Those are metaphoric only. They shouldn't be taken literally, they become superstitions and then they impede religious progress, spiritual progress. If you take them with metaphors, they're fine because you can't create a soul. A soul is pure consciousness and it never was anything but pure consciousness. So when you talk in terms of, of mind-only schools, you're talking in terms of manifestation, of projection. And the best projector is the mind in uh, cohorts with the intelligence. See, if you have your intelligence uh, in hand, then you'd be the best projector. We talked about that last week in the Bardo states, right? Is that you project bodies. We had a new chart called the palette of future lives. And so it had all these empty canvases, which you wrote on it, that an enlightened soul can choose its own body, can choose its gender, can choose its parents, can choose its mission, can choose what karma it wants to bring and what karma it wants to neutralize. It has a wide variety of choices to it based on its enlightenment in the previous lifetime. So it's never caught. It's a, as Zen Buddhism says, it's a glistening serpent, never caught in its own coils. So this glistening serpent, you see, uh, still it remains itself and it remains unfettered, unbound. So in that way then you have this description of the self which is engaged in dynamism. That's Shakti power. It's manifesting itself. So from the great mind down to the collective mind you're going to have to make connections and then finally it arrives at your individual mind. Uh, not the brain, it'll eventually get there too because the body, the brain is born with the body. But when we're talking about the individual mind, we're talking about your power to think, and your power to separate yourself out, and your power to, um, to uh, use your intelligence. And might as well then start counting all these other practices you do, your power to meditate, your power to renounce, your, your power to have compassion, and all the other qualities begin to spill out of that. If you have this great choice. Put very well in terms of the view of Mahamudra. Now that's the first part of the view that I've just described to you. The second part is, whereas the universe itself is contained in the mind, the true nature of mind is the realm of illumination, shining with radiance that can neither be conceived or touched. So if you look into the ordinary mind, you're not going to see this. Even the very astute intellectual mind does not seem to hold its radiance very long because it's very identified in with the brain and with instincts and with heredity and with genes and with incarnation and it doesn't know about reincarnation yet. It's just thinking in terms of one lifetime scenario. It's not thinking outside the box yet. So the ordinary mind is, if you look at it and, and uh, observe it, scrutinize it, examine it, it's going to look very different than this description that the Buddhists are giving you, that the mind itself is the realm of illumination. Everything is emanating forth and that's because the mind itself, the original mind, is the realm of radiance, of intelligence. So you begin to remake your idea of what the human mind is. First of all, it's not the brain and second of all, it's not ordinary mind its original mind. And now you see why examples are used, pure mind, original mind, no mind in Zen. You have these different descriptions for it that mind disappears. 
see. Like in the, uh, we'll see this at our next Zen retreat here in SRV next weekend. We're having our Zen retreat, and you see the ox herding. Uh, ten of them, levels of finding your consciousness called ox herding. And as the original uh, Zen paintings depicted it, each one of the circles, ten circles, gets lighter and lighter until there's nothing left in the last one. Uh, the ninth one is, the penultimate one is just blank because the mind has gone completely out of the ordinary. And the tenth one is left blank with a little opening in the border to, to illustrate that consciousness is now free. It's outside of its boundaries and it can come back into its boundaries and leave its boundaries whenever it wants. My teacher used to say that detachment is the first level of teaching, but you should be able to detach and attach at will. That's the yogic level of attainment. To attach, to detach is good, but to attach and then let it go, that's better. Because then you can identify with certain things, probably better to say associate with them. Either way, you can identify or associate with certain things, and then when you're done with that thing, you immediately let it go. So you're never bound. You're not ever caught in your own coils. See, a snake that's just one big knot. And by the way, many people are looking like that in today's stressed out times. They're looking like they're caught in their own coils and they're just a knot of nervousness and fear and doubt and ignorance. And they're not free from their own coils. Their own coils here would be karma, the, the karma that they're creating. So they're knotted up in their own karma. So that's not a good way to pass from your body. You'll, mm -hmm. you'll return to your body, your next body, in that same kind of condition which is evidenced by how many people are born bound and how few are born free. Uh, as contradictory as that sounds. Don't sing the song, please. <laughs> <laughs> so this is all some, some preamble and some information about the view, but the real essence of the view here is that all of manifestation, everything that you see manifested is mind itself. It's, as Holy Mother used to say it, the world is just, uh, objects are just thought made manifest. The pillow you sit on, the chair you sit on, the tree you're seeing, they're just thought made manifest or uh, uh, or just um, intelligence solidified. Everything uh, begins to look to you less and less like an object and more and more like a congealing of intelligence when you reach a higher state of samadhi. Like we were talking about this morning at satsang, if you were there in the live streaming. So that is a condition of samadhi that happens to a person. It's probably one of the earlier samadhis, is that everything begins to look like a manifestation of your own wisdom. That's called savitarka and nirvitarka and savichara and nirvichara. Those are uh, two samadhis in four divisions, with, four, with two divisions each that uh, are all about knowledge samadhis, seeing everything as manifested intelligence. So here we have another version of that yogic teaching, Patanjali, in the form of this Tibetan yogic teaching in Buddhism uh, about the view. This is the first of three uh, positions. One is view, one is practice, and one is action. So I hope that um, that is clear to you what the view is. In other words, this is a view you should adopt if you want mm -hmm. to be a Buddhist or if you want to be seek spirituality outside the box, as I was just talking about. You should start thinking of things, everything is my own mind, manifested. All objects are my own intelligence, solidified. And that b puts to death fear and doubt because now there's no doubt as to who did this, who made this karma who created this world. And you don't bring God down to a creator anymore. You leave him a create. A create is a word Swami Vivekananda came up with. Uh, God does not create, is not a creator. That's the Trinity you're talking about. God in its most subtle form. But the absolute Brahman whom we just sang about, Allah, God, uh, Kali, those are, those are hands off. You see, those are pure conscious awareness ideas and um, pure consciousness itself. 
And so that's not going to engage in creation. It's going to have to, to divide itself. The world is going to have to become other than the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And then when it's other than the Word, it can start the business of projectionism or vibration. Because Brahman is vibrationless. No vrittis there. Yoga chitta vritti naroda, one of the most famous slokas in yoga. See, yoga, union with God, is uh, niroda, destroying the waves of the mind. So when we practice the view of the Mahamudra, we're saying all of this is a manifestation of the mind, and oh, guess what? That's not exactly a positive thing. <laughs> That's not necessarily where we want to be. We want to be where we are, and that's in pure mind, that doesn't create, that doesn't vibrate, that doesn't project. Unless we can do this projection very consciously, like Vivekananda said, I hope a man's not going to be reborn until he can be reborn in a purely conscious state. That's going to mean with his own intelligence in hand and knowing that the whole universe is a manifestation of that. That's the view. And that the mind is a pool of radiance, a pool of, a pool of intelligence, and especially when it's mated with the word, mahat, or the, the, the cosmic mind. So there's the teaching of the view, first part of three parts of the Mahamudra. Second is this, because the thing that will come up is what about maya, what about samsara, what about suffering, what about miseries, what about karma? What about death? What about decay? What about birth, growth, disease, old age, decay, and death? See, what about those things? Shift over to this chart for a minute. You can see that both Buddhism and Vedanta note the six billows or the six transformations. And they may have a few differences in it, like thirst and hunger is concluded in there, an unsatiable thing that the uh, embodied souls accompanied with as far as desires and the need to eat and drink. Um, uh, but nonetheless, the six billows and the six transformations are very prominent teachings in any good wisdom yoga. Uh, and Vedanta and Buddhism has them both. So what will come up then in terms of hearing the view is what about all of these things? You're, t you're giving me here comes the pie in the sky philosophy again. You're giving me this bright picture, but um, I'm not able to see this bright picture without filters. I'm not there yet. Maybe I don't even believe that that bright picture is really true or it even exists. I'm an atheist. I'm an agnostic. I'm a pessimist. Uh, I don't believe in religion. I don't believe in enlightenment, whatever the case may be. Then you're still seeing this through the filters of suffering, through maya or Buddha called it Mara, the evil one. So that unripened ego or that darksome mind is still laboring under those fetters, under those passions, under those kleshas, under those vipurayas, under those billows, and under those transformations. So then how does Buddhism with its great Mahamudra deal with that? That's called the practice. Errant thoughts, the antithesis of the view, are liberated in the Dharmakaya. The Dharmakaya is one of the three bodies of the Buddha. It's called the field of teachings that come from the Buddhas. There's the historical Buddha and, and, and so forth. You know, uh, but the Dharmakaya is really the emanation of the wisdom through this enlightened intelligence from the stream of Buddhas that have come to earth. And you want to look at Zen Buddhism, you're talking about 52 generations of living Buddhas that have happened since Shakyamuni. It's a very rather shocking thought. People don't think of it when they think of Buddhism. They just think, oh, there's Buddha, and then there's the religion, 2,500 years of Buddhism. But they don't think about this succession line that we just talked about here from Tilopa to Naropa to to Marpa, to Milarepa. Well, in Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, yes, there's one, but in Chinese Buddhism and in Zen, if you want to take it all up to contemporary times, there's been some 52 generations of living Buddhas, guru to disciple. Each one of those, the Shakyamuni manifestation, in manifestation. 
if the view is is that uh, everything is a projection of mind and the mind is the realm of radiance, then the Buddha is living in that radiance and every time he emanates forth, he's a Buddha. He's never not the Buddha. So his students, as we would put it in our tradition, are mind-born children. They're not having necessarily, although some of them did later, and some of the Tibetans do too, they're not having blood children or fa blood family, they're having mind-born children passing on the teachings to people that necessarily from all outer circumstances they didn't even know or had never met in that lifetime. Yet they recognize the Dharma successor, he comes forward, they transfer or transmit or, uh, uh, yes, transmit is a good word. They give the transmission of wisdom to that Buddha successor and that awakening uh, continues on the line of teachings. Guru Parampara in our tradition, uh, this line of 52 generations of Buddha in the Buddhist tradition. So that's something to think about. So that is the one living Buddha in all 52 generations that you're seeing. They're one consciousness. It appears like many souls. It's just one soul. You might not want to use that word self or soul in terms of talking about Buddhism, but one uh, living pure mind stream. So the antithesis of the view is uh, is this idea of uh, errant thoughts. Where do these negative thoughts, negative karmas come from? If the universe is mind made manifest, then it's probably pretty easy to see why there are so many violent and impure and destructive tendencies and objects in the universe. It's come out of the mind, and the mind is an admixture of good and bad and pleasure and pain and life and death and, and various transformations. So there you, there's a way of explaining in a, in a very sensible way why the universe is the way it is. Instead of just asking the question, oh, why is there so much suffering? You see, because it's, the universe is a manifestation of the mind, and the, and the mind is the source of disease. It's the source of remedies too. Let's look on. He says, awareness, illumination is always blissful there. So meditate in a manner of non-doing and non-effort. These are the key points of the view. Oh, I'm sorry, of the practice. So errant thoughts are liberated in by the teachings. You do, uh, one of very profound ways of saying it in Vedanta too is that you go for holy company and you go looking for the jnana yoga uh, and you get that transmission from a teacher and then your mind is transformed. You don't have doubts and fears and worries anymore and your suffering goes away. That is, there are certain types of suffering that remain like birth, growth, disease, old age and death. But even death as we're talking about now and as we spoke about last week starts to diminish its hold on you, doesn't it? You're not thinking about, oh, my death is coming. You're thinking about living a conscious life that, that transcends death. So death is reduced to a very paltry role in Divine Mother's universe. As one song in India sings, very paltry role. See? And uh, doesn't need to be the end all and be all of existence. It's a, it plays a very small part of things. So you begin to think about death differently just when you begin to think about the nature of mind via this view. So errant thoughts will come forward when you hear the view and you will dunk them into the Dharmakaya like a towel into an uh, into a ocean, as Sri Ramakrishna said. The mind is the towel, the ocean is these teachings, Dharmakaya, and you just dunk them in there over and over again you don't ask why and you, and you don't uh, worry about the outcome. You just wake up one day and you say, my delusion is gone, gone, utterly gone. And there all of a sudden your ignorance has died and you're not deluded anymore. You might as well call that enlightenment. At least it's a first level of samadhi or wisdom samadhi that's dawned upon you. And that's what they're speaking about here. So meditate in a manner of non-doing, of non-effort. These are the key points of the view. 
why should you exert much effort uh, towards uh, that kind of goal-oriented practice when the Dharmakaya will do it all for you. All you need to do is show up, is that I think the, the mantra of today, you see. All you need to do is show up, sit in the Dharma, and the Dharma will remind you of your true nature. Many beautiful songs have been written not only in the Vedantic way and in the Bhakta tradition, but in Tibetan Buddhism too, by beings like Milarepa. Uh, says, uh, when, I, when I think of the Dharma, I can't help but get inspired. And when I get inspired, I can't help but share the Dharma with other people. I'm so uh, enthused about the Dharmic teachings and what they did to me that I have to go out and share them with others. I caught that disease <laughs> early on, some 20, 30 years ago, and I started singing the songs and teaching. And when my teacher saw me doing that, he said, yes, sing those songs and your whole life will become a song. And I can attest to that. So it's become a song. And we'll look at that uh, in terms of King Janaka's victory pretty soon. His song of victory. That's a very beautiful teaching out of Lord Vashishta. But let's finish the Mahamudra first. Otherwise, I'm going to get uh, too many charts going at once, which is my tendency. I'll read that again. That is the practice. Errant thoughts, the antithesis of the view, are liberated in the Dharmakaya. Awareness, the illumination there, is always blissful. Meditate in a manner of non-doing and non-effort. These are the key points of the practice. So they want their practice to be free of goal orientation, effortless, natural. After you have just exposed yourself to the Dharma and to the idea of the mind being radiant. Isn't it a wholly different thing than saying, oh, my mind's full of sin, my mind's full of uh, uh, imperfections and so forth. How, how much progress can you make under such a weight? How long, how many lifetimes is it going to take you to get uh, salvation, what to speak of liberation? So if you take this Mahamudra, the great seal, and impress that upon your mind, you see, all of a sudden you have changed everything about the conventional way of thinking that your culture, your family, your family line, your series of births have taught you and taught you wrongly. You're deprogramming in the fastest way when you take up a teaching like that and you take it seriously and you begin to practice in a way of non-doing and non-effort. It's rather assuming the Advaita Vedanta, which is why we're calling this class Tibetan Buddhist Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. It means non-duality as proposed by Vedanta or by the great uh, seers of India long before Buddha. Uh, it's just continuing on in those 52 generations of Lord Buddha with a new mark, you see, with a new seal that fits the age. So first there's the view, then there's the practice. The <coughs> Mahamudra seal, the three-part seal, ends with action. How is the action described? In action, the naturalness in the action of naturalness, they call it, the ten virtues spontaneously grow and the ten vices are thus purified. By corrections or remedies, the illuminating void is never disturbed in any way. These are the key points of the view. So, I'm sorry, yes, these are the key points of action. Now, uh, that's a beautiful way of looking at problems problems and solutions. You think these are coming to my mind all the time and, and resurfacing, but it's never going to disturb the perfect uh, illuminating void, which was based on the view. You see. Uh, the view is, again, the, all manifestation comes from the mind, and the mind is a place of radiance. So when you take that view, you've set a new precedent it's a non-dual way of living. You're saying, all of this is perfection. All of this is the light of radiance. Everything is radiating with intelligence. A puja is going on everywhere. However you want to put it, and it's whether way you put it through your particular temperament and your particular practice, if you take on that view, then immediately what's going to happen is the teachings will come forward from within you and 
you will know how to act. See? That is, any trials or challenges that you that accost you along the way of action will be immediately liberated in the Dharmakaya and in this illuminating void because that's its nature. And it's all based in the view. If you have the view, right orientation first, then you're going to be very sure of that. Here's the eight Four Noble Truths of and the Eightfold Path. Perfect view is first. <laughs> so let me let me uh, depart from that Mahamudra chart for just a second to show you how the Ashtanga Gamarga, the Eightfold Path, which was much earlier than this Mahamudra seal uh, in Tibet, says it. You must have some Samyak Dristi, perfect view first. If you have that perfect view, direct insight into the Dharmakaya, into the field of the teachings, knowledge of the unity of all existence. You see how it's explained in earlier Buddhism, in the Hinayana path, the earliest of all Buddhist t teachings, 550 years BC. And then you can go on to perfect resolve, you can go on to perfect speech, perfect conduct, perfect livelihood, perfect effort. Who wouldn't want those? Especially perfect livelihood. <laughs> in this day and t in times, everyone is having to make their way in the world. And then finally end up with perfect mindfulness and perfect concentration. We were talking about that in the live streaming class today. I mean, I'm live streaming satsang this morning. That is basically a certain kind of concentration called samadhana, which allows you to concentrate only on reality and put everything else behind you. That's how one gets to faith, from belief. One goes from belief to faith. It's going to be a key piece in the process is when you get that perfect concentration. So it's, it's very important to the Eightfold Path, as you can see. So let's quit calling Buddhist uh, Buddhism uh, pessimistic. It starts out by saying that there is pain, dukkha. And the pain is sorrow, lamentation, grief, despair, and so forth. Uh, you know, uh, the six billows and all of that. But it then turns towards the truth of the origin of suffering. You're supposed to find out the origin of where these sufferings are coming from, these karmas and so forth. So you're going to begin to inspect your mind. Because if the Mahamudra is looked at, then the view is not perfect yet, is it? You're, you have some imperfections in the, in the view. And also, the uh, Dharmakaya has not been resorted to fully yet. You've heard the teachings, but you haven't dipped yourself into them. You haven't immersed yourself in them. So you, you still have some... Uh, deep disciplines to undergo in the spirit of non-effort and non-doing. And so you show up and you put yourself into the teachings. So that's going to help you find the origin of your sufferings. That will lead you to the truth of the cessation of suffering. So that's where Buddhism in its apparently pessimistic beginnings turns optimistic, doesn't it? You find that there is a cessation of suffering there. And uh, that's... Uh, at the foundation of yoga and Vedanta too. Uh, basically, you transcend your suffering, you transform it. You transform poison into nectar, as the tantrists say. And then the fourth noble truth is there's an eightfold path that will help you um, realize the cessation of suffering. And that's what we just looked at. So, four noble truths, eightfold path, a very prominent and a very um, well-known teaching. I won't go into it in depth here, but I referred to it because of the idea of perfect view. Now back to the Mahamudra, we see that to finish the class, they have a little clarification for us in this sidebar that I've put together at the bottom. The three principles of the central practice of Mahamudra. A, the basis is that all phenomena bear the seal of combined emptiness and luminosity. You can see later on how Zen benefited from this kind of interpretation that Tibetan Buddhism gave to the early Hinayana path of Buddhism. Basically, emptiness and luminosity are put together here. When you first hear the teachings of 
Advaita Vedanta or you first hear the teachings of of Buddhism, it sounds like nihilism and voidism to you. Uh, you think that maybe there's the, the idea of emptiness is that there's nothing there, so you don't know how to meditate on it or how to think of it. You think maybe it's just the emptiness of ego, but Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa has said, as long as you're in the body, you can never get rid of the ego. You just have to keep it at a minimum, keep it uh, diminished, its, its influence. So you began to think in terms of a more practical way of looking at it, and when you get to the basis of the teaching in Mahamudra, you find out that they're putting their description of emptiness is that it's full of luminosity. It's not emptiness like a void or emptiness like blackness or emptiness like nothingness. It's luminosity. Didn't we just say in the view that the whole universe is contained in the mind and the mind is the realm of luminosity? That's a little bit of further description about the view. Now, the path, I'm sorry, the practice, well, yes, the path or the practice, they call it, is divided up this way. Direct, effortless experience of the nature of pure mind. That's where we have these great Advaitic teachings in the Astravaka Samhita or the Avatuta Gita that says, um, Mano Vanasham Natu Naiva Shudam Guru Padesham Natu Naiva Shudam Sadanga Yoga Natu Naiva Shudam means that um, you cannot purify the self by practice of the yoga. You cannot purify the self by bowing at the Guru's feet. You cannot purify yourself by uh, by destroying the waves of the mind. Because the self's already pure. Mm -hmm. So you should be thinking about that teaching of the Mahamudra then that's telling you that your direct spiritual experience of pure mind is going to end this cycle of problems and solutions. The, the, the illuminating void is never disturbed by problems and solutions. And it's never uh, bothered by remedies like health and so forth. So if you're, you're taking the slow boat to China or you're coming at it from the bottom up, then you, you're trying to gain longevity of the body through healthful means, you see. But you haven't walked straight up to the pure mind and looked at it and said, there are no problems, there are no solutions, there's just the great illuminating void, and I'm it. <laughs> do you have the power and wherewithal to do that? Well, Mahamudra is allowing you to do that by proposing a very special view to you. That the whole universe is a manifestation of your mind, and that mind is radiant and pure by inception. It's called the original mind. You get it, Om, original mind? But be careful not to use Om wrong, or it's ordinary mind. And in Zen, that would be okay, too. Original mind is ordinary mind. Call it every man's consciousness. But it has to be realized. That's what the Vedanta insists. There, the self is perfect, but uh, you can't uh, you can't uh, do away with the problems of thinking about that until you realize it. Shamakrish used to say, uh, if you go outside and you keep pricking yourself on this thorn bush that's on your porch, and uh, so you yell at the bush, burn, burn. <laughs> but it doesn't get rid of it. So one day you take some wood and a match out there, <laughs> burn the bush. No more thorns, you see. So that's kind of like getting rid of the whole shooting match, you see, the whole karmic shooting match. You, you just burn the bush by action. And so you have a practice and a view practice and action going together in a perfect seal that you've impressed again on your consciousness. And you might say that this seal is actually already impressed upon consciousness. That these are not just um, um, possibilities or perspectives that they're presenting to you, but that they found out that this is the truth of the matter. And this is just how they explain the truth. The void illuminating mind, free of all problems 
and the Dharmakaya, the field of teachings that are there in the mind. You see, we're always looking at the field of problems, the field of errors, the field of solutions, diseases, remedies, but we're never looking at the field of Dharmakaya teachings, which are pure and perfect in their inception. Intelligent particles, streams of intelligent particles, we're not taking recourse to that supreme remedy, if you want to call it that. Kingdom of heaven within you, we're not, we're not standing up and looking at it and uh, facing off with all demons. Get thee behind me. Christ is saying would be, you know, well, now I find the Dharmakaya, uh, this is natural. This, is, this has been my practice of non-doing and non-self-effort. I arrived here without uh, a, a bead of sweat on my soul, see. It's been perfectly natural. You say, the word they use here is spontaneous. Naturalness of action spontaneously grows in you, they say. <clears throat> so, in five ways they put this. When focusing occurs, focus without objective. That's there. When focusing occurs, focus without objective. Remember, everything has been pointing to this goalless orientation. Goal-oriented practice is always going to bear a fruit, you see, and, and a fruit isn't necessarily what you want. That is, a fruit is going to be called a remedy, right? Uh, and then there's going to be another solution that may fall, another problem that may follow that solution. So until you get to the ultimate solution of all, then you're going to have to follow this very effortless way. So when focusing occurs, focus without objective. When stabilizing occurs, stabilize without distraction. <clears throat> that is, let your meditation stabilize in the view, in the practice, and let your action also follow suit. That will be the nectar of naturalness that they talk about, in, again, in the Ashtaraka Samhita and the Avadhuta Gita. These are great non-dual scriptures. When shifting occurs, shift without grasping. So if you, you have a perspective and a view and you, have to, you find yourself still laboring under old habits, oh, God creates, or seven days creation theory, or uh, whatever you've been programmed with, but now you realize that, that that's, uh, you can let go of that. There's a higher way of saying that, a higher way of realizing that. So when you make that shift, shift without grasping. Make it a natural sequence, uh, because you're now released into the Dharmakaya. You're like, Sri Ramakrishna said, a fish laid out of a gold bowl, uh, goldfish bowl, you see, into the lake. Imagine what it would feel like, having spent most of its life in a, life in a goldfish bowl, going under a little bridge, <laughs> again and again. You see, that's circles of lifetimes. So imagine if somebody just took it and said, oh, "I'm going to free you now, like a bird from a cage, into the air," and the fish was released into the lake. You see, so that's what happens when you enter into the Dharmakaya, the field of teachings, and uh, it completely releases you from old ways of thinking. So when that happens, let it happen naturally. Don't grasp it. Like, oh, I've seen the truth, I must hang on to it. You see, because anything you grasp at tends to run away from you. you see. So you must shift naturally if you're to follow your original vow that you made toward the view. If you accept this view and you practice it, this is the way you're going to have to practice it, in other words. And when manifestations occur, experience them as reality. Before you're looking at manifestation as a problem, you see, uh, uh, I just had my first baby, uh, not me personally, uh, uh, but uh, if you were to say that, you see, then you can look at it as manifestation, right? The manifestation of a soul and a body, this brings a great problem for me, lots of concerns lots of potential worries, lots of responsibilities, lots of duties. But if you were to look at that as a manifestation of God, then you'd be looking at your child as um, a manifestation of reality. It's come out of the your own mind, right? Because all manifestation has come out of your mind, so this child has come out of your own mind. It does, hasn't come out of just your body. It will look something like you, most likely, but uh, uh, it's really going to look more like your mind. See. 
and uh, you'll you'll be sharing the same mind. And if if you raise the children in the Dharma in the, the Dharmakaya in the field of teachings of teachings and virtues, then it will develop those things quickly and will release itself. And then you've got uh, a guru all your life. You see, very possible that uh, disciples who go to gurus uh, had them as their child in an earlier lifetime and taught them well, and they exceeded them. My teacher was always saying that. You must become greater than your teacher. Because why? For some sort of show who's better? No, because this is the way uh, the, the Dharma is passed in a line of succession. You, you want your child, your student, or whoever is there to learn it better than you. Because in the next time around, that might be your guru. And you might be coming back to that uh, that soul, you see, for some help. And it realized in a very special way the teaching you gave it. So to give them the dharmic teachings, to immerse them in the dharmakaya, is the best way to raise children. It, and to start out then, you're going to have to experience them as reality, not as illusion, not as maya, not as problems, not as uh, my life is over. You know, and I have to give everything to my children now, but you have to see them as manifestation of God. Seeing God in everything. The fifth and final point of the path they, they bring out is when liberation occurs, allow that to occur naturally. They say, do your meditations and so forth and your shifts of, of thinking without grasping. But when finally that moment of illumination comes, make sure that you let it dawn on you naturally. That's called sahaja samadhi. And uh, the idea, the, te- the story they give about it is an elephant enters into a lake and nothing happens to the lake. Samadhi happened to a person and doesn't look any different now than he did when he was ignorant. It's the same person. Mm-hmm. Which is why Holy Mother said, have I grown two horns? Is that why you've come to see me? In other words, they hear she's enlightened. They go looking for her. They expect to see some spectacle? <laughs> Do you still the village woman sitting there with her white cloth on, kneading bread on the floor, and talking to her students? But she's enlightened, you see. But you can't see it from the outside. You didn't see the process of enlightenment that went on inside of her. Uh, or, in her case, for how many uh, lives of, of uh, enlightenment she lived in the case of some of these great beings, that their enlightenment happened so, so far back. Or possibly in the case of a Nietzsche Siddha, they never knew what suffering and ignorance was. Any suffering they knew was on your account. <laughs> That's the sacrifice Ishvara makes when it comes into form. You know, I mean, that's very well instanced in some of the studies of Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother's life we took. Once Sri Ramakrishna lost a nephew, I think it was, and he said, oh, now I know what the people of the world feel like. When I lost him, I felt like my heart was being wrung like a wet towel. See? So he said that as if he had never experienced suffering before. So this is how you have to look at a Nietzsche Siddha or an avatar, and say it wasn't a time when they, were never, when they needed to get enlightened. These are very special souls. Um, cosmic, beyond cosmic souls. Uh, they come straight out of the light. They're cut in pure consciousness. Pure conscious awareness is their form. And so when, when they take on a human form, it looks like their mind, pure. And that's why Sri Ramakrishna could be the paragon of universal harmony, could bring the Divine Mother path to earth, and could liberate and uh, bring five million people to enlightenment, which is how many are following him now after just a little over a hundred years since his passing. So when you see a soul like that then, and you put it together with view and practice and action, you see this great seal is impressed upon them from the very get-go. That's their nature. Mahamudra is their great nature, the great mudra. They're, They're it. They're the sign. Christ said that about himself often. So you're seeing God appear in human form. In the human form, if you follow this teaching, 
then uh, it begins to look like that manifestation is divine. And you can be sure about that manifestation. Now you have to be sure about your own manifestation and how you're looking at things. If you put on yellow glasses, he used to say, you'll see everything yellow. So he means when you put on the Dharmakaya, the teachings, everything will look like Dharma to you. But if you didn't put that on, it would just seem ordinary and regular. You see. So there's a, a certain perspective, view, that you have to put on in order to see God in human form. And eventually, beyond form. God is with form. God is beyond form. God is beyond form and formlessness too, is how he used to say it. Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. Now let's look at a little more clarification of the last third of this Mahamudra great seal. It's in terms of the result, freedom from liberation and the agent of liberation. It's very Zen-like too. You see how Zen would have benefited very much by seeing the manifestation, the expression of Buddhism over these many generations, because that's a very much a part of their teaching as well. That, um, uh, like I said, in ox herding, you find out, uh, you find the ox, you find the tracks of the ox, and pretty soon you have to go through these 10 stages. By the time you're at the ninth and 10th stage, then all of a sudden you're at this point of giving up liberation or the thought of liberation or being the liberated one and you're just in a perfectly natural condition. Ordinary man's consciousness only attended, as Mahamudra would say it, by this emptiness that's full of illumination. That's why you don't grasp after it. If you grasp after objects, they're empty, right? It's the same rule, you can't grasp after enlightenment either, because it's empty. But you're talking about two different kinds of emptiness. One is vibrating at a billionth of a particle's emptiness, a billionth of a second, you see, particles. Uh, and the other is an emptiness that's empty of everything except the illuminating void, the pure mind, the Buddha mind, the original mind. So the idea would be that there's no liberation, and that's actually what's put right here in this uh, excerpt from famous excerpt that everyone likes from the uh, Diamond Sutra. It says, there is no nirvana to attain beyond. There is no samsara here to renounce. Mm -hmm. So you're getting over the idea of even the subtle most of dualities. And that view of naturalness and that path and action of spontaneous wisdom that you have decided to take on as your own view, as your own practice, as your own activity, now is convincing you and coming around full circle so that uh, there is no nirvana to attain anymore and there's no samsara to renounce. That's what this means. Freedom from liberation and from the agent of liberation. Also from intellection and conceptualization and from false identities and from hopes and fears. As Swami Vivekananda put it so nicely, <clears throat> say peace to all. From me, no danger be to aught that lives. From those who dwell on high, to those who lowly creep, I am the self in all. All worlds, both here and there, do I renounce. All heavens, all hells, all earths, all hopes and all fears. Thus be thou calm, Sanyas and Bold, say Om Tat Sat Om. Thus cut thy bonds, say Om Tat Sat Om. So, in beautiful Song of the Sanyas, in one of the verses, Vivekananda declares, you know, be beyond, get beyond these false identities and strike off hopes and fears and uh, be your true self and your true nature. So, this Mahamudra, the Great Seal teaching, is a precious gem for all the practitioners of the Dharma. This is Swadharma, the universal Dharma, that comes in the form of teachings of all religions. In this way, it's put in terms of the Dharmakaya, the field of teachings flowing ever and always from the Buddhas, from the living Buddhas. 
Now, with the Mahamudra and Great Seal in, under our consideration, I wanted to show you, or at least get a start on before our break, King Janaka's Song of Victory. <clears throat> It's a chart that I don't think we've seen very often. It's one of the now uh, 120 or 125 Vedanta charts that I've created from the teachings there. And everyone, of course, who has ever taken teachings in the Vedic tradition very much likes the idea of King Janaka because even Sri Ramakrishna mentioned him quite a few times in the Gospel that M was able to put into form a splendid manuscript that everyone should read, Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. And he talks about King Janaka as one of these special souls who, as he quotes, drinks his milk from a brimming cup. That is, he's a king, he has riches, he has lands, he has servants, he has wealth, he also has enlightenment. So everyone likes that. You see. Mm -hmm. Oh, I wish I had everything. I want to become infinitely rich with the whole territories of the Divine Mother. Uh, so they think in terms of being like King Janaka. Do you want to be like Shankara? Do you want to be like the renunciate Buddha? No, 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 I'd rather be like King Janaka, thank mm -hmm. you. Because he has everything and drinks his milk from a brimming cup. See. Well, also Ramakrishna has gone into the life of King Janaka, which if you read Yoga Vashishta and other ancient scriptures, and also his meetings with Vedavyas and his son, Sukadev. If you read a lot of those, then you'll find out how uh, these great souls often approach Janaka uh, to find out how he did it, uh, how he remains so free even amidst all the trappings of the world. Very much like this great seal. He must have this great seal imprinted upon his consciousness very deeply in order to go into the world and remain free. It's a very difficult task to do that. They say any kind of association with wealth whatsoever leaves a little distortion on the mind. It doesn't matter who it is. If you're close to wealth, there'll be some distortion. Sri Ramakrishna said, uh, an object in a mirror reflects in a mirror. I mean, he's talking about wealth when he gives that story. That a rich man's treasure, you know, even if he puts it in a bank somewhere or hides it or buries it, his always, mind is always on it. He's always thinking about it. So it's a great distraction to him. And um, if you keep it near you, that is, your mind is the mirror. So if you keep an object near you, it reflects in the mirror. So that's a rich person's wealth, or anybody's wealth, really, if they are still under the insinuation of worldliness. So King Janaka, how did he do it, being free of all that? Sri Ramakrishna used to say about him that you'd find him with his priests or with his with the rishis or in his library studying the great scriptures. You wouldn't find him counting his wealth or enjoying his foods or exploring his lands and, and gloating over everything he owns. Whenever you went looking for Janaka, he was always in his library reading the books or talking to the priests, uh, the temple priests, and finding out more about divine reality. The more he could find about it, out about it, the better. So that's the way. Uh, in fact, he, I think it was a story about him where he renounced wanting to be a king and some great soul talked him into keeping, uh, keeping the station of, of royalty so that he could help others. And that's how sometimes they they do to people who get enlightenment, who want to leave behind the world. They say, oh, no, stay behind in the world so you can help others. And that's how, because they have compassion, then they will stay behind and, and keep that station. Uh, uh, the ego of a teacher, Sri Ramakrishna used to call it. We keep the ego of a teacher for the sake of others. So when we talk about King Janaka's Song of Victory, we go a little bit deeper into the life of that great soul. Look at how it's broken up. Melodies of mourning, improvisational airs of awakening, variations on a theme of victory, and the serenades of samadhi. Sorry, 
I'm a musician and uh, have been all my life and probably many lives. So I constructed his life under terms of music and gave it uh, subtitles like that. Well, his melodies of morning, here you are uh, looking at them. Uh, don't forget about uh, these melodies of morning, uh, the six billows and the six transformations. Nobody can escape those. Even the avatar suffers those. Uh, so there are some sufferings you can transcend and some sufferings you have to forbear. Titiksha, it's called. And don't also then forget about the Mahamudra as we look through this because this is all talking about um, getting out of that problem of suffering. All errant thoughts are liberated in the Dharmakaya, the field of teachings. That's what you need to know. You just go into the teachings, you immerse yourself in them, you don't need anything else. You don't need health regimens. You don't need um, exercise. Those things you can take recourse to if you want. You certainly don't need asana and pranayama. You just go into the teachings and you immerse yourself there and you get as deep into them as you can and all problems go away. And it's the quickest way, Vivekananda said. The sort of wisdom way is the swiftest way to come to enlightenment. It will probably take you about one lifetime of dedication, whereas other paths takes you many lifetimes. For instance, three lifetimes if you get, you follow conventional means according to Buddhist idea of nidanas or links of, of uh, suffering. So before we go into King Janaka's uh, song of mourning, here's what suffering really looks like over three lifetimes. Avidya, root ignorance, that is, I don't know my true self, so I lived a whole life not knowing my true self. My true self is the void illuminating radiance of mind. That self we just talked about in the great seal. Then I developed mental samskaras, impressions, because I was ignorant. Then I lived a whole life in ignorance and now my modus operandi is ignorance. Avidya. Right there. Then, based on those mental impressions, and I'm going to go through this swiftly, uh, relative consciousness develops. That's worldliness. Awareness gets crystallized by previous life experiences. And you might notice that in people, and maybe have noticed that in yourself as you've struggled to get free, is uh, uh, that you've fallen into certain traps and moorings that kept your sailing ship from, uh, as Ram Prasad sings in some of the songs, from escaping out of port into the open waters, flying, becoming free. And those things are keeping you bound. So strike off thy fetters, as Vivekananda says, bonds that bind thee down. From relative consciousness, name and form, that is, this is where a new body develops. These developed your first body in ignorance, your second body starts here, and a fresh body is formed based on your impulses from the past. Then the six bases are operative. They expose the realm of the senses to more karma. That is, you begin to focus the senses upon the objects, and they, they become, uh, they convince you that the world is real. Sri Ramakrishna says, the more lives you live in ignorance, the more the world appears as real to you. Beautiful statement in the, in the Gospel of Ramakrishna, hidden amongst a thousand other pages. The more, the more lifetimes you live in ignorance, avidya, the more you begin to, to uh, believe that the world is real. The first thing Vedanta tells you when you come into holy company is, the world's unreal. Only Brahman is real. So people overlook the second half of that statement and just begin to uh, grieve that the world is unreal. Or they don't want to hear it. Say, oh, I don't believe you. I'm going away now to experience the world some more. And so this process, uh, they haven't broken or snapped the chains of rebirth yet. And uh, if, you don't, if you want proof of that, just go out in the world and start looking. Just look and see how many people are really free, how many people are really bound. How many people are nervous wrecks and suffering? How many people are peaceful? It's going to convince you right away that there must be something at least to this idea of reincarnation 
and in ignorance. See. And the Mahamudra then will convince you that there's always also something to reincarnation in radiance out of your own pure mind after dipping yourself in the teachings and getting free coming to know the truth and the truth shall set you free, set you free brother yeah <laughs> so the six bases sparsha contact and relations furthers the problem intermingling with the world and its people and its objects contribute to karmic conditioning you're not intermingling with holy company with the dharmic with the dharma and the people who are in sanghas and the people who are in special situations the, the seekers the spiritual beings you're not mingling with them you're mingling with people of the world families in ignorance and uh, societies in ignorance and so sparsha that actually thickens the pot you see. more vines of karma are growing in your second lifetime it's going to take you three lifetimes to get three three of this they say vedana sensation contact with the senses with their objects basically believing the objects to be real and seeking pleasures of the senses and forgoing the difficulties of spiritual practice what is sweet in the beginning krishna says in the gita you must eschew that and what is sour in the beginning, you must take that to yourself. What's sour in the beginning is having to do your spiritual practice. What's sweet in the beginning is those things given to you as objects to please the senses. That turns sour later. So he's wanting you to free yourself from that tendency by seeking that which is seemingly poisonous to the rest of the world and turning it and watching it turn into nectar as you practice. Then you have Trishna, craving and desire which thickens it. Attachment, a new birth, that's the third body. <laughs> then jati, rebirth again, and old age and death. We've gone through this chart several times before. I bring it up simply to show you the stages of progress that happen to be in these 12 links, or nidana as they're called in Buddhism, which cover some three lifetimes, which will uh, unless you have a very special boon, special grace of a holy soul, a lumen soul to teach you, uh, and a desire for liberation and a human body, it's going to be very difficult for you to snap this in less than three lifetimes. That's the way the Buddhists present it. Three lifetimes would actually be quick. <laughs> You're talking about people who are living hundreds and thousands of lives in ignorance over long cycles. Uh, they bring that up too in the teachings. All right, well I took, uh, before I launch into King Janaka's Song of Victory and all its nuances and its melodies and its themes and variations, we should stop here for our break, but make sure to stay in there because this is a very precious chart which is going to reveal some beautiful things. And I have a few songs I'll sing for you that are uh, in tune with with uh, King Janaka's own music. Um, we may have to go offline for about 15 minutes. So our camera person says we're going to have to go offline for 15 minutes possibly. So if you, you usually get to see the charts, the live streaming audience up close, but if that doesn't happen, please don't leave. We will be back. Thank you for your kind attentions. Namaste.
We are back live streaming and here live at the uh, Servi Ashram in Honoka'a, Hawaii. And we have given and delivered the teaching of the Mahamudra today. Last week it was the Bardo states, <coughs> all in conjunction with living a conscious life, dying consciously and being reborn in consciousness free of ignorance, root ignorance, mula vidya which is, according to Veda Vyas, the father of Vedanta, and, and others, the, um, the first to five hells one falls into. First, forget your true self, then uh, the ego flourishes in ignorance, and then that's the second hell, and then attachment and aversion kick in, uh, and then finally you cling to life or you fear death. And that's the fifth and lowest of all hells. So interesting to describe hell as not a location somewhere in space and time, like somewhere under the earth or some realm, uh, physically speaking, but actually back in the mind are all the hells, right? And doesn't that also go well with the view of the, of the uh, Mahamudra, is that all manifestation comes from your mind. So you'll find heavens and earths and hells all there in the mind that's fertile with the power of projection. But then we must say and remark in conjunction with that teaching that the worlds of the illumined souls are full of light and full of compassion and full of the willingness to help remove that delusion and return the person to the source of enlightenment. And that sounds much more like the uh, view of Mahamudra, <clears throat> the way that the Buddhists want to present it. So we went through that in the first half, and in this second half, which will be slightly shorter, we wanted to return after we looked at the 12 links, or Nidanas, in Buddhism, over three lifetimes, what brings a person back in ignorance, then we want to see how this very great example in Vedic lore, King Janaka, uh, found his way to enlightenment and became famous throughout the three worlds as the person who has both enlightenment and everything the world has to offer. Drank his milk from a bringing, brimming cup, as Sri Ramakrishna said about him in this day and time. So let's look at his, his uh, you might say, learning of the Mahamudra in his own way had to start off with these melodies of mourning, sort of like the discourse of divine discontent that Sri Ram uh, went through after he heard, uh, after he went out on pilgrimage, like Buddha went outside the castle. So did Ram go outside the king's castle and, and see suffering and then came back in, in a very sobered state of mind and was very indrawn. King Janaka also had that idea looked at the world and said, it's afflicted with pain, deluded by the world of Maya. That's one of the melodies of mourning. Brooding on the short span of life in the illusion of time. So people are trying to seek longevity, which is, yeah, they want to have a long life filled with everything. As Sri Ramakrishna said once, a man got a boon from God, one boon, and he said, all right, well, this is what I want, O oh Lord. I want to uh, eat sumptuous foods on gold plates with my great-grandchildren. You see the cleverness? He got three things in one sentence. Gold plates means he'll be wealthy. Sumptuous foods means he'll be well taken care of. And, and his grandchildren mean he's going to live a long life. So he got three things in one boon. So that's the clever worldly man Sri Ramakrishna is talking about there, trying to increase his, his life his span. But Holy Mother was of a different uh, predilection and preference. She said, why go on rotting away in the body for so long? Um, she would say things like that. See, what is this body in the end but just a few pounds of ashes? What's this big deal you're making about it? Well, you can see that uh, that could be taken as a pessimistic teaching, but actually if you look at it in terms of the Bardo states and the Mahamudra, then you see how many 
conscious lives you can live, then if Shankara passed away at 32 years of age and Swami Vivekananda passed away at 39 years of age and Sri Ramakrishna at 50 years of age, they did so much and lived a, such a thoroughly pure and full life in the Dharma in just a matter of three or four or five decades. So they know, as Krishna says in the Gita, that that which dies is born again and that which is born dies. So there's no grief about that. You simply let go of your attachment to the body and you have faith in this safe returns. It has to be dharmic returns that you're looking for. Uh, if you're clinging to life, as I just said, according to the father of yoga, that's the fifth and lowest hell, clinging to life. Abhinavesha, they call it in Sanskrit. Or sometimes you could say fear of death. So that's coming up here in this morning, Melodies of Mourning. Brooding on the short span of life and the illusion of time might as well just be death, thinking about my death is coming. Despondent due to the desires of the gross mind and ignorant. So the time you have left, you're spending in depression. <laughs> you have, you're brooding on how short your life might be, but instead of enjoying those brief years that are given to you in, a full, in the fullness of the Dharma, you're instead spending time in depression what we call brooding, teaching of brooding here in SRV Loka. In the Bardo state we're in here right now of 20 years of SRV life is that brooding is the biggest waste of time possible. You end up looking back and saying, oh, I really didn't need to brood on that at all. It never happened. Mm -hmm. So uh, one takes a lesson from that and, and uh, begins to live more in the moment, in the eternal moment is the teaching. Another m melody here in this despondent way is kingdom and rulership seem empty, dull, and evanescent. So who but a king could say that? If he has a kingdom and he has wealth and pleasures, same thing happened to King Bali and other great kings in the Itihasa stories of India. That means the spiritual lore that you get from the secondary scriptures. Then if these kings have said that I've been a king and I've had everything that a king could want, but still it seemed it left me empty and unfulfilled, then you know that um, life is evanescent like that. Rulers and their vast wealth have only disappeared over time by the hundreds and thousands. <laughs> Rulers of royalty comes and goes. The gods in the heavens will vanish like fish in the ocean. So he's now he's looking at it less on the earthly level and more toward the celestial level, that he's been around long enough and read enough scriptures over history, like we're talking about here, Buddhism, 550 BC, Tibetan Buddhism, 700 AD, Zen Buddhism, 17, 18, 1900, coming from China. So we're talking about a long span of time there, some 2,500 years or more, so scriptures have been left behind by all those levels of religion and in other traditions too have been left behind enough for you to find out that gods and goddesses come and go they're like humans uh, they might as well if everything comes from the mind as the mahamudra says then they might as these gods and goddesses have to be coming from your own mind and if your mind changes they change now, of course, that's the teaching on a relative level. If you're in cognizance of the original mind, then you know that there's one eternal consciousness that never changes, and everything else is just a manifestation of that. That also fits with the teaching of the Mahamudra, doesn't it? The view that this, and uh, also fits with the practice. So, good to know these teachings and note. Remember, this is one stage of King Janaka's journey what he this is the sobering stage this is the neti neti stage or the awakening to his predicament in maya stage weakness reigns due to energy wasted on sense objects oh, i'm sorry weakness reigns if that's what i've said due to energy wasted on sense objects so the yogis have found out about that that that's why they draw the senses back from the objects because energy is going out as intelligent particles, as streams in the form of prana, and it's fastening on objects and it's getting frittered away there. 
and then it doesn't come back to them. So before it gets attached to the object, they, they touch on the object and detach. The seer does not become the scene. The seer realizes instead in the Mahamudra that all of the scene has come from his own projection. And his own projection is full of light. But if he goes out and gets attached to the manifestation of it, it turns dark. So he's taken the kingdom of his soul, which is all pure radiance, and turned it into a kingdom of physical objects, which is all empty and dark. And he broods on it. And he gets despondent. And even if he's a king, he doesn't enjoy it for very long. So he begins to experience old age, which is coming. Death recurs, and the timeless Brahman is never quite realized. So that's where you get these songs that I was promising you to sing about. Astavat krida sakta staruna stava saruna sakta krida stava chinta sakta hare brahmani kopina sakta vaja govindam vaja govindam vaja govindam mudamate samprapte sanihite kare nahinahi rakshati I was a baby I was attached to my mother's breast when I was a young boy I was attached to sport when I was a young man I was attached to a young woman when I was an old man I was attached to anxiety <laughs> because death was about to make its appearance you see. <clears throat> and also Kante Kanta Kaste Putra Samsaro Yamativa Vichitra Kashatvam Kahakuta Yastas Statvam Chintaya Tadia Brata Raja Govinda well, Who is your wife? Who is your child? Ex exceedingly wonderful is this empirical process called Maya. It's enchanting. Who are you and whence have you come from? Oh man, think about that here in this lifetime. This was the man who lived 32 years, who wrote this song. And every one of the line of succession in his Guru Parampara, uh, his line of generation stretching back to Shankara's time in 700 or so AD, added a verse to that song. So it's the longest composed song in existence. It's been contributed by by different acharyas, they're called in Shaivism, from Shankara on through all the succession of the Shankara order. They each added a verse. A very long song now. What was that? 1,300 years? I mean, basically, Tibetan Buddhism was just getting its start when Shankara was living. It's an interesting juxtaposition there. And Shankara's guru's guru was Gaudapada, the great non-dualist, who did the commentary on the Mandukya Upanishad about Om. Uh, so that was now also prior, just there. It was a very rich, rich period going on in that particular five to six hundred year uh, uh, period of time. So that in terms of death and brooding and so forth, you see, he says, uh, alas, to the Supreme Brahman, I was never attached. I was attached to my mother's breast. I was attached to sport. I was attached to a young woman, I was attached to anxiety and death, but I was never attached to the Supreme Brahman. Pare Brahmani Kopina Sakta. I was never attached to Brahman. So that's what he says here. See, Brahman is never quite realized. Death recurs, but the timeless Brahman is never quite realized. Always stays just out of my grasp. See. If you had to study the Mahamudra, then it probably wouldn't be that case because your practice and your uh, action really is telling you to just to strive with non-effort, right? Let Brahman come to me because I am Brahman. Yeah. <laughs> Let's plant a few little enticing things in there, you see, to, to attract Brahman out from hiding. And when he comes forward, he won't be coming back from the world, he'll be coming from inside of me. When I went to pluck the fruit off the branches of spiritual effort, I found the whole tree inside myself. Mm -hmm. It's a saying in the Sufis. When I went to pluck the fruit 
of spiritual effort, uh, off the branch of self-effort, I found out that the entire tree was inside me. Not just the branch and the fruit, the tree of realization was inside of me. That's Mahamudra stuff, isn't it? Another melody of mourning is, the deluded mind thrives as the basic root of the tree of samsara. So we're not talking Mahamudra there, are we? That's radiant mind, the radiant illuminating void, they call it in the Mahamudra. Now we're talking about this ordinary mind, not even ordinary mind, deluded mind. That's uh, dull, mudda. That's chipta, uh, Father of Yoga says, scattered mind. Like mustard seeds blown out of a package is how they, is they describe chipta mind. Can you ever get them back in again? Especially while the wind's still blowing. So the wind has scattered the mustard seeds out of the package and mustard seeds are so fine you can't find them in the grasses. You'll never get them all back again. That's the predicament of scattered mind. In fact, dull mind is a step up from that. <laughs> as, as, as it goes, you see, scattered mind will turn um, mentally challenged, you see, later, retarded. Dull mind will just stay dull mind. See. Restless mind will stay restless mind. Youth is ignorance, adulthood is, adulthood is base desire, old age is suffering. So these are realizations that sound pessimistic and are sobering, but this is the song King Janaka was singing before he went into his garden and ran into this holy man. You see the kings in India, they open up their gardens to the holy men. So the story in Yoga Vashishta where this comes from, where I fashioned this chart from was Basically, he went into his garden one day and he was thinking about evanescence of life and these kinds of things here. But he, he heard that the, um, all the holy beings that had gathered in his garden, they only stayed there you know, a day at the most or two. They don't stay anywhere more than that time because their vow is to wonder. So they just need a place to stay overnight and maybe some fruit to eat off a tree or maybe he'll send them some cloth or wearing cloth or something free, you see because he's got all these stores. So he's walking through his beautiful garden and various holy men are in these different nooks. So they're all singing. A lot of them are singing. Or they're chanting something. And so he goes close to each one of them and listens. It takes like a whole cross-section of his garden to hear these different, uh, sort of like Sri Ramakrishna, listen to all the holy men outside of his village of Kamarpakur when he was a boy. He used to gather firewood. And then the holy men would all let him sit there and listen to their talk and listen to his their songs. And Thakur, Sri Ramakrishna, had this immediate recall memory, so that's where he learned all the songs and all the teachings as a young boy. Everything he heard from all these different sadhus from different lineages impressed itself on his mind. And that's later on he was singing songs and, and spouting off scriptures and wisdom when he'd never read a book. See. So he was he got a straight transmission from these sadhus that were wandering over India and they just happened to come through that area of Kamarpakur, his village, as, as sort of a crossroad for their for their um, their um, uh, wanderings, see, perambulations see, uh, around the the four cardinal places of holy places of India they, they go. So just like that. King, ja King Janaka was, of course, a different soul, kind of soul, and the Paramahamsa was there in his garden listening to all these songs, and they really impressed him. Uh, impro impro improvisational airs on awakening are uh, about that. He got these teachings from these beings and listened to them and began to think about them. So he's, his view begins to change, talking about Mahamudra. All of a sudden, his mind is getting a, a facelift where his face is getting a mind lift, maybe we should say. He says, First I detected the vile thief of my atmic jewel and expelled him. So now, by hearing the songs of the sadhus, they're all singing in bliss, various kinds of bliss or knowledge or meditation, you see, and chanting about the atman and so forth, the, the, the pure mind, the true nature and all of that. And so, all of a sudden, he detects the jewel 
the, the jewel thief, that is the, the uh, uh, mm -hmm. thief of his Atmic jewel, and he expels him. So he's improvising. Now he learned the art of japa and meditation via contact with his guru. So now he finds amongst those souls somebody who could teach him, who recognizes him as a, as a potential or future lineage holder, and he goes to that person and bows at his feet, and gets the mantra, and practices japa. Classic. See. Dispelling mental unrealities like I and you from the mind is his next improvisational air. He sings. Then never allowing delusions an entrance into the mind again. So he makes sure that he knows the truth. He sets up, he expels the negativities from his mind and then he sets up a guard at the gate so they can never get back in again. That's very effective sadhana. All errant thoughts are liberated in the Dharmakaya. So what did he do? He went to a guru and he, f he, he heard the teachings. And then the teachings themselves set up a protective gate. O oh mind, fence yourself around with the name of Kali, 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 Ramprasad puts it. And then None of these errant thoughts can enter. None of these dangers can penetrate. The fiery fence of Kali, Kali, Kali means mantra. F fence yourself around with the mantra of Kali. No Atmic jewel thief can come anymore. See. In fact, your garden will be full of holy men instead of thieves. Then, boring a hole in the pearl of the mind to dispel all darkness. So he's threading his mind, as it were, on this grand mala with other seers and saints, other realized souls. Isn't it beautiful? It's very the only time I've ever heard it put that way that when you do japa on the mala, the beads, that you're actually turning yourself into a bead and you're boring a hole in your mind and that mind is going to get placed on this great garland of skulls that Kali wears. Or you're in company with the holy, you see. So it's a very beautiful way, in his own unique way of putting how japa and, and mantra turned into his mind becoming a bead, and he drilled a hole in it and strung himself in the company of the saints and seers on this great mala of the mother. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah. So he turned his mind into a japa bead, and mother will just recite through him. Then stringing a mala with the taut thread of sobering experiences. You could say, well, maybe he didn't really have to do that, but these melodies of mourning that he went through now become very uh, effective as helpmates. They give him deeper detachment. He's not going to go back anymore to the world, as he said. Uh, no more will these delusions enter the mind again because they have natural stopgaps. Do you want to go back to this kind of life? then keep saying the mantra. In other words, in Mahamudra style, keep dipping yourself in the teachings again and again and again. As somebody said at the break today, I like repetition. That's the, that's the most effective thing. So to hear the spiritual teachings again and again, even if we met every Sunday for a month of Sundays and just went through this chart again and again and again, mm -hmm. or the Mahamudra again and again and again, under the different atmospheres and the different vibrations of our mind, with the different gunas predominant in each individual, we would be getting new teachings, new insights, and gleaning new visions out of it, and deeper and deeper knowledge. But, of course, you're getting a plethora of different teachings here at SRV, in different lineages. Let's look at the variations on a theme of victory. See how his mind changed after he did japa and mantra. Victory over my great adversary, the deluded mind. The disappearance of suffering that had afflicted me. The attainment of a life and mind filled with quiescence. And adoration of the jnana wisdom that allowed this state. So King Janaka was a wisdom knower and that's why Sukadev went to him so he couldn't quite get that enlightenment from his father, who was a great seer. And so his father said, well, I've set, I've set some meeting up with a friend of mine. Go see King Janaka. 
<laughs> and Sukadeva went there and had his doubts, his last final vestige of doubts, dispelled by King Janaka. And King Janaka insulted him horribly at first, kept him waiting and didn't treat him like a holy person. And, and, and Sukadeva remained completely impervious to the insult. So here was a meeting of two great equanimous souls, you see, who, who weren't going to get thwarted or deterred by anything conventional whatsoever. They were after the truth and that was all that mattered to them. And when they came together, it was a, a great meeting. Sukadeva went back to his father and said, how did that go? Well, that was great. I learned what I wanted, you see. King Janaka is the man. Right? Mm -hmm. He dispelled my final doubts. Just like Lord Vashishta did for Sri Ram earlier. In that same period of time, these stories come from. Very, very ancient. Uh, many millennia before Christ. So these variations on a theme of victory are very beautiful. And then come the serenades of Samadhi. You see these, these um, raginis, they're called. Uh, there are actually uh, quite a few of them. Uh, but uh, their ragas are Indian uh, modes in which you play on the sitar or sarod or bansurai flute or so forth. You learn raga. We learn scales usually in the West, but they learn ragas and they improvise off ragas. And very beautiful. Uh, that kind of scale, you see. Midnight ragas and afternoon ragas and bright sunshine, early morning sunrise ragas and all sorts of beautiful uh, musical melodies that depict the time of day and, and, and uh, put the mind in a certain mood so that it can uh, retain peace of mind, stay in a peaceful state. So these are uh, those raginis that I, a few of them I selected that are helping King Janaka, as it were, sing these serenades on samadhi. So let's look at those. What object is there in this world for me to accomplish? Sounds rather Mahamudras like, doesn't it? Uh, attain everything in the mode of non-effort, of non-doing. So there's nothing for me to accomplish. It's all mine already. Immediately you take that stand and that perspective, that view, it all of a sudden changes you. And samadhi is inside of you, not something to be sought in a post-mortem emancipation. That view is very important. That non-dual view is why this is called Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. Because teachings like Mahamudra and seekers like King Janaka are Advaitans. Uh, what are they? And their stories are, are wonderful to tell, you see. Marpa made Milarepa build a house a dozen times and tear it down. Constructed this beautiful mansion-like house, not good enough, tear it down, start over. Had to tear it down, start over. Did that a number of times to get rid of a karma in Milarepa that wouldn't have gotten rid of in that lifetime otherwise. And Milarepa followed his guru's instruction and escaped that karma. So the lives of these beings are uh, songs of mourning, songs of practice, improvis improvisational practice, variations on samadhi and the actual attainment of samadhi themselves can be put in that terms. Uh, it's not just here we get to sit and see the essence of the teaching. Oh, we get the Mahamudra, or we get the four jewels and the six treasures, or we get the eight limbed yoga. Oh, how aren't we lucky, you see. But basically, luck has nothing to do with it. Uh, the idea is that these teachings are all in the Dharmakaya. They're in the field of teachings that are the radiant, illuminating mind. And they're both empty and full of light. That is, the only thing you can find in them is light. If you take apart the intelligent particle, as we've talked about before, it'll ex implode with a great light. It's called insight, realization, and these are happening at a very powerful level, not just an everyday insight. Oh, now I realize that. See, I heard someone on the cell phone the other day talking to someone. I overheard the voice say, oh yeah, now I realize where I've left my purse. I mean, what kind of a realization is that? See, <laughs> uh, you know, why don't you realize the non-dual Brahman? 
verses come and go. You see. I never quite realized <laughs> I brought that Brahman, you see, as, as he says. So, the intelligent particle exploded is an implosion. The atomic particle exploded is an explosion. And one gives brings in the possibility of harm and destruction, and the other brings in harmony and compassion and realization. So, uh, this stream of particles is now coming at you from my eyes and from my lips and from my mind, as I came at me from my teacher, and at him from Sri Sharda Devi, and to her from Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa. That's lineage succession. That's Guru Parampara. And the whole thing has been about immersing yourself in an ocean of teachings. If you want the quickest way out of ignorance, seek wisdom. Nahi Gyanena Sadrisham Pavitram Miha Vidyate. Krishna says it in the Gita. The God of love is recommending wisdom. Knowledge is the greatest purifier, Arjuna. Bar none. So immerse yourself in an ocean of teachings. Either Milarepa wants you to do that or King Janaka wants you to do that. Are they Buddhist and Hindu? Or is that just one ultimate reality? One consciousness? Are the field of Dharma teachings of the Buddha any different than the field of Vedic teachings? It's just what you accent in them in any particular age for any particular group of people. So let's look at some of these serenades of samadhi. What object is there in this world for me to accomplish? Where is illusion? To my present scrutiny, all is pure jnana. Now he's sounding very much like Lord Vashishta because that's his Mahamudra. All is wisdom. Everything is, in, is intelligence. Uh, that great mind-born son of Lord Brahma. Lord Vashishta was one of the ten mind-born sons of Lord Brahma. You know, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, the Trinity? Well, Lord Brahma thought one day and had ten mind-born sons born to him, and Vashishta was one of those. Many beautiful stories about conversations between Lord Brahma and his son, Lord Vashishta. You'll find them in the Yoga Vashishta, some of them. So to my present scrutiny, all is pure jnana. He's looking around and he can't find anything but Ganam everywhere. Everything is reflecting intelligence in Ganam. Even the, as the Upanishad says, the old man tottering along in the staff, pure Gana. The green parrot with red eyes, pure Gana. <laughs> There's nothing but pure intelligence out there. I cognize nothing but the one immaculate, immaculate Atma Gan. It's almost a repetition of what I just said, but it drives the state deeper into the heart of ignorance, you might say. It's not just Ganam, but it's Atma Ganam. Ganam could be scriptural wisdom, but when it's called Atma Gan, it's knowledge of the self who composed the scripture. The Amsa Avatar, the one who actually uh, came back and put it in terms of words you could understand, like he's doing here in terms of music. I will never long for any object I do not come across naturally. I will never evince aversion to any object that I duly come by. So the teaching of attachment and aversion uh, and the insinuation of attachment and aversion is destroyed by such a view, Mahamudra kind of view. It's taken that stance. I will never ev evince any aversion for any object that comes to me naturally, nor, nor will I attach myself to anything that comes to me that doesn't come naturally. So attachment and aversion are taken to task there. And the natural way of things, the natural arising, as the Buddhists call it, are there, is there. I will remain immutably fixed in my own self of Atmagyan. Now he is equating himself to that very same wisdom that's of his self. All events and happenings will occur as preordained by Dharma. So, not preordained by maya or by karma, but by mother and by dharma. 
he's given himself to the mother of the universe. So Maya is now out of the picture, Mahamaya is in the picture, and karma is now neutralized and dharma is now operative. In other words, he may have, have known Ganam, he may have known Atmaganam, and he may have equated himself to Atmaganam, his Atman, but he still has to live a life, and so he chooses a life to live in Dharma. In fact, for in his case, you could probably say Swadharma. Let's see what he says about his own state. Observing the actions of the world, wherein men flutter like birds in the air and perish, and feeling no more significance than a speck of dust floating in a sea of dust, I gave up the ephemeral wealth and the objects of this world and fixed my mind immutably in my own self of Atmagyan. Dharmakaya, teachings of the Dharma which point to reality. In Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta, it's going to be put in terms of the self. In Buddhism, they kind of skirt the word and you'd have to call it Buddha nature or Pragya Param. Buddha used that term. Pragya, intelligence, param, supreme. You, know, you get the gist here, we're back to intelligence again. That which is the view of Mahamudra. Everything is made of intelligence. The whole manifestation is from my own mind, via intelligence, stream of particles. A stream of particles unknown and unseen by the particle theorists of this day talking about, I've got a particle for you to examine you see, and to take apart. It's called mantra. It's called bijam. And I'm going to take it apart with japa and with a focused mind, which I have bored a hole in so that plenty of light can get in and plenty of darkness can get out. So King Janaka's victory over ignorance his song of victory, very classic, and we haven't looked at this chart for years and years, maybe if we ever have at all. So it's good to put it in conjunction with the Mahamudra teaching. Now, we talked about um, Shankar and his 32 year old, 32 year, years of life. So I wanted to bring out another chart which um, puts it in terms of Ganem. That is the six bodies, it's called. We haven't looked at this for a while. Six illusory bodies. I've subtitled it Clues to the Risks and Dangers of Embodiment. So a cautionary teaching until one reaches such a, a view as Mahamudra proposes and such a way of, of practice and action that that precious teaching of the Dharma evinces then one has to look into this path of emptiness in 1980, pretty much uh, in the early stages, correlative between Buddhism and Vedanta. Vedanta calls it 1980, not this, not this. Buddhist, Buddhism calls it shunyata, emptiness. So basically you're taking away overlays. You're seeing through the appearances of things so you can see them as they really are. And when you do that, you see objects and worlds as they really are. That's a part of the realization. You don't just see them as empty and say, I give them up. See? Well, I see they're not fulfilling. That was just the beginning of King Jonica's journey, wasn't it? When he was enumerating the various songs of misery, things that he had to go through, even as a king. That was just the beginning of the journey, so that's the early stage. And then eventually he began to improvise see with the uh, get free in other words he was more spontaneous he was able to hear the teachings of the sages and seers in his garden in his pleasure garden and and act on them see so that's the practice you went from the view to the practice and from the practice you go to the action and we looked at that so and along the way you might say in Vedanta you go this through this neti neti process let's look at Shankara's way of putting it he says as long as one does not give up the idea of the self as the body, there is no hope for liberation. Do not take this body for the self, just as you do not take your shadow or your reflection as real, nor the body that you see of yourself in dream or in imagination. None of those you would consider your real body. However, unfortunately, you're considering this 
physical frame to be a real body. The more lifetimes one lives in Maya and ignorance, the more one believes the world to be real. So you're believing yourself to be the body every time you're born. That's called avidya. And you're in samsara or maya when you do that. How about taking a birth where you know you're not the body based on immersing yourself in the teachings that taught you that you're not the gross body, nor are you the mental body, nor are you the dream body or the deep sleep body. I'm none of those. That's an at a very advanced stage. An at the stage of transcending suffering based upon karma, that's a very early stage. You should get through that and get over it. But when you get to the idea of renouncing all three bodies, not just your physical, but your dream body and your causal body too, then you can know the true self. There's a chart I have for you next weekend called Three Worlds, One Mind. It's a Zen Buddhist teaching. You're going to like it very much. Three Worlds, One Mind. And so even in Buddhism, they're thinking in terms of that Triputi, Three Worlds. Let's look then. There's another quote that I added in here because it was so beautiful. Sometimes the signs of a luminary are his clothes. Sometimes precious clothes or a deer skin, and sometimes the clothes of knowledge. So you find out some of these people are clothed in knowledge. That's their modus operandi. That's their atmosphere. They walk in a room. They bring knowledge to you. They're not fooling around with anything other than that. That's their default zone. They won't fall any lower than that. A guru, an acharya, a teacher, a paramahamsa, an avadhut, Basically, when you approach them, you're approaching knowledge. And they've arrived at knowledge, and they're not going to go any lower than that. You're going to have to rise to meet the Dharma. Shake hands with the Dharma, you see, because that's what you're doing when you find a Kala Pichet or, or a Karmapa, or like I did, or a, a Dalai Lama, or a King Janaka, or a Swami Vivekananda, or whoever in whatever fold, you're meeting the Dharma face to face and you're shaking hands with higher teachings. Now, like leavened bread, begin to rise. So Shankara has here three bodies he wants to. Let's look at Anadeha, the physical body. And that has to do with that first quote, quote up here. Do not take the body for the self. Eschew that idea. That's bad upbringing to think that. Bad physical upbringing, bad social upbringing, bad familial upbringing, and bad spiritual upbringing, religious upbringing. It's bad, bad, bad. Do not fall into that illusion. You know you're better than that. You know you're of a much higher nature than that. Now, the next body down here is the Chaya Deha, shadow body. It's an eclipse. Oh, no, it says, in an eclipse, when shadow of the moon falls upon the earth, the ignorant believe the sun is to be swallowed by a dragon. <laughs> in old days, uh, I forget the name of the dragon. Uh, Rahu? Rahu, maybe. Yeah, I knew it started with an R. They used to say that when the moon's going away, it's Rahu, it's a dragon in the sky that's eating at a gulp at a time. Well, that was the belief that was present at the time. So that's what he's referring to here. In an eclipse, when the shadow of the moon falls upon the earth, the ignorance believe the sun is being swallowed by a dragon. So that's Chaya Deha, your shadow body. Do you believe you're your shadow? Sri Ramakrishna had great teachings about that, actually. He said, when the sun is straight overhead, the man has no shadow. Is that a good koan or what? See, Vedantic koan. But when the sun is either before him or back of him, then his shadow is long. He's talking about the ego. If the sun of knowledge is risen, you have no shadow. See, straight above you, you cast no shadow. That's illumination. But if you haven't got illumination, the sun is far away from you, either back or forward, your ego stretches that far. So a very beautiful way of, of speaking. Sri Ramakrishna had hundreds of ways of describing those teachings. I found 700 in the Gita and turned them into a book. It's on the shelf of all his stories and the different commentaries that I 
put with them for you. So you could also put it in terms of music. Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Bhuti Rupena Samstita Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namo Namaha Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Chaya Rupena Samstita Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namo Namaha Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Jati Rupena Samstita Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namastas Yai Namo Devi Namo Namaha Ya Devi Namo Namaha Ya Devi Namo Namaha Ya Devi Namo and so forth and so on. You're singing out of the Chandi about Devi, Divine Mother. She exists as intelligence in all beings. Buddhi Rupena Samstita. See, Lord Buddha was well named. Mahamudra is well named. Everything is a manifestation of your own mind, of your own intelligence out there. Objects are just thought made concretized. And Chaya Rupena Samstita. She exists as shadow play in all beings, in the hearts and minds of all beings. She exists as shadow play. She's playing with you at different levels of Maya. The game's afoot, and your task is to see through it. See, we play tag when we're kids, and you have to get back to home base, right? Well, there's an equivalent of that game in India, and it's called Granny. You have to get back to the Granny. See? So that's mother. So you're safe when you're at home base. Nobody can tag you. Nobody can turn you into to another lifetime. You're safe, you're back at the source. So that chaya, that shadow play, uh, she told me to go down and she winked at me. Said, go down to the worlds and play, my son. And she winked at me. The wink means never forget where you came from. And that might as well translate into saying, never forget that you're not the physical body. That's just something that nature will provide for you. I've decreed that nature will provide everything for my children. And then they can play amongst nature, but they should never get attached there. They should come back to the source, back to the granny, back to home base. Very simple teaching for children. So the Dharma includes those kinds of teachings too, the great teachings, great teachings of the Dharma. So chaya is shadow play. So you have a shadow body, don't believe in that. Neither would you believe in a reflection body in the water. This is on a uh, beautiful uh, drawing there of uh, the guru looking into the water, you see. Adjasa deha, the reflection body. As the reflection of the moon in a puddle is not real, just so the body is not the self. The next level of body is Swapnadeha. Shankara says, nor the body that you see of yourself in dream or in your imagination, that's not your real body either. So it says here, one awakened Brahman does not identify with the body which becomes like a body seen in dreams. And in fact, since the mind Mahamudra style is the void of self-illumination, it's full, it's full of uh, emptiness and light at the same time, simultaneously, then you can draw anything there you want, just like the palette of future lives. You can draw anything there you want with the power of, of your own projection, of your own mind. So you're doing it in the physical body here in dreams tonight. And what kind of a body shall I create for myself tonight, you see? And you're getting in there and you're playing with various forms because the mind is full of illumination, you can do that. But you know, how good at sporting are you? And how good are you at coming home when mother calls? You see? <laughs> when we were kids, you see, we lived in Alaska. So uh, some, sometimes close to the Eskimos and people like that. So 
my mother learned the way the Eskimo women called their children home. Hoo hoo, really loud. Hoo hoo, H O H O dash H O H O, shouted out into the frozen wastelands, you see. And then all the kids would come running home. So she used that in Oregon. And later, when we were growing up, I was 12 years old and growing up there in, in Portland, Oregon, up to my 20th year in schooling and so forth and music, that when we were out playing sports in the neighborhood lots, then we'd, we'd know when it's time to come home because she would shout that out, come out the door two blocks away and shout it, and we could hear her. No, it's time to come home. So basically the teaching is when mother calls, leave the body behind, all kinds of bodies. You do it in dream tonight, you leave your dream body when mother calls you back to the waking state. Mother is doing everything. Ram Prasad sings, Mother, my mother, is at the foundation of everything. She is my all in all. She is my special thing. She does all action. Other people only call it their own. So you think, oh, I'm waking up. But mother intelligence woke you up. Well, I'm, now I'm falling asleep. Mother intelligence put you to sleep. She knew when your body was tired. But she's not telling your mind to fall asleep in ignorance. She wants to see how good at sporting you are, keeping awake in the dream state, keeping aware in the deep sleep state. Those are things that we haven't attained yet. And those are the very things that the illumined souls have attained. They know consciously their dream state. It's lucid. They know consciously their deep sleep state. It's full of light. It's part of your mind, dreaming in deep sleep. So you might as well put the Mahamudra teaching of the Tibetan Buddhists right next to the three states of consciousness of Gautapada, waking, dreaming, and deep sleep, and show the correlations. That they're talking about the same thing. You're calling it mother intelligence in this case. There's also the ego body, ahamkar deha. These are starting from gross and getting more and more real, you might say. The ahamkara body is Ananda Mayakosha is very deep in the process. He says, the limiting adjunct called the ego is the shadow of the Atman that lives in the heart. It enjoys and suffers as the case may be. So it's that ego in you that's putting you through the various mournful melodies of your early awakening. See, until you can awaken and, and get a little bit improvisational with the whole thing. <laughs> singing those mournful melodies, you see. So ego is playing with you in that way. Who, who, do, you, who do you prefer as a playmate, mother or the ego? I mean, basically, you might as well put it in that, in that way. Shall I surrender myself to mother or shall I play more with my ego? Let's end the class right now, you see, on that statement and just walk away thinking about it because that's very, uh, that's deep, man. That's profound. When we give up our preoccupation with the ego, then we'll surrender ourselves to the great self. The self must surrender to the great self. That is, tachnayo ra vrni mehe gatum yogyaya gatum ye nupatei. May I surrender the small self into the big self and make uh, a reverent sacrifice and always revere the Lord and Mother of all sacrifices. That's one of the earliest peace chants in India. May I make a great offering of my small self into the great self and may I always revere that process. So I have to keep offering day to day See, this, this rascally ego. So it stays attenuated, just like my karma. The final body here is jnana deha, the knowledge body. Definitely the, more, the most real of all bodies. They're all illusory bodies. You'll have to go beyond knowledge after you've gotten rid of ignorance to get to truth. So knowledge body too will disappear. But he says about it, the intellect takes bodies in different realms. Waking, dreaming, and deep sleep belong to it. So you can see how you're getting close to the idea of intelligence. You're getting very, very much towards a very profound and aware level of your own consciousness. Leaving the 
physical body behind and all these illusions along the way, then it's going to be very good for your spiritual growth. And you'll begin to identify more and more with the jnana deha, your knowledge body, until your ignorance is gone. Does it sound like dipping yourself in the dharmakaya again and again, day to day, reading the scriptures, going to satsang, going to class, listening to the teachings, pursuing your spiritual path, engendering the Dharma in you and in everyone else. When I hear the Dharma, I can't help but share it with everyone. Milarepa sang that song. So sometimes clothes, sometimes precious clothes like a king, Janaka, sometimes a deer skin like a Shankara out in the wilderness, sometimes the clothes of knowledge. Then putting on and off different clothes, different bodies, is a matter of little moment to the realized soul because every one of his rebirths is going to be conscious. Every one of his lifetimes is going to be conscious and every one of his deaths, or so-called deaths, is going to be conscious. It's all done in consciousness because of the presence of awakened intelligence, pragyaparam, in him or in her. So this will be the end of my presentation on Tibetan Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta today. We will have next week, we have to beg our apologies of our live streaming audience because we will not be broadcasting next week, but we will be the week after. On the third of the three classes on Tibetan Buddhism and uh, Advaita Vedanta. In fact, maybe we'll even review Zen Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta. We'll see how the retreat goes. So please look for us to live stream weekend after next at the same times. And uh, another, if you want to uh, do something else live, then come to our retreat next weekend. Uh, because it's going to be held right here at the Hawaii Ashram. And you're welcome and your friends are welcome. Come and dip yourself in an ocean of Dharmic teachings, as we do here as often as we can. So here, let's end with a quick Sanskrit chant. <coughs> Om Asato, Om Asato Ma Sadgamoya, Tamaso Ma Joy Tir Gamoya, Mrichor Ma Amritam Gamoya, Abir Abir Mayeti, Rudrayate Dakshinamukam, Tainamam Pahinicham. Om Shanti 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 <clears throat> Lead us from darkness to light, from lower truth to higher truth, from the unreal to the real, and from the illusion of death to eternal life. Reach us through and through, O Lord and Mother, with thy sweet and benign presence. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. May peace be unto us, may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om